Thank you all for coming out. I know I have to admit I'm one of the people that if I had great intentions of going to a lecture and it was really cold out, I might decide to stay home. So I appreciate that you all came out. Um, uh, so and thanks, Anthony, and obviously and Cindy Hudson for inviting me to come be part of the Naturalist Lecture Series. Um, I, uh, my name is Laura Heady. I work at the Hudson River Estuary Program through uh, partnership with Cornell University. And um, I work at the DEC office in New Falls. So uh, the estuary program is a partnership between the New York State DEC and, um, uh, and in my case, Cornell. But we have a lot of uh, partners that enable us to um, implement the program which I'll tell you a little bit about, but um, as you probably know, we're here tonight to talk about wetlands specifically. Um, let's see, does this work? Yes, great. So um, are any of you familiar with the Hudson River Estuary Program? Uh, have you ever seen the blue and white signs with the sturgeon when you're crossing streams? And So those were put up by our program a long time ago to help people recognize that when you are um, you know, driving throughout the watershed and crossing those streams, they're connected to the Hudson River Estuary. And our program works to achieve um, six key benefits. Um, a vital estuary ecosystem, um, like, like this amazing um, view you see here with um, the, the different uh, wetlands that are in the river, the fish, um, the, um, the, just the whole ecosystem. And we do that by taking a watershed approach. If you're familiar at all with the DEC, you might be used to the um, idea of the regional offices. So we're in region, DEC's region three, which covers, um, I think it's about six counties. And um, the estuary program actually spans across um, the DEC's jurisdiction from Region 3 up into Region 4 because we're really trying to think about the whole ecosystem, not just the jurisdictional boundary for what we're trying to conserve. Um, we're also trying to work um, toward helping communities and the region um, uh, keep, keep water clean, whether it's through um, grants for wastewater treatment plant improvements, um, you know, helping communities recognize how to deal with stormwater. Anyway, trying to keep the water that flows into the estuary um, as well as drinking water uh, clean. Um, also, we work uh, with communities a lot to try to help them build resiliency. Resiliency to environmental change, to climate change. And a lot of that work is through um, training and education with community leaders and helping them recognize where their natural resources are, what they can do to protect them at the local level. Are any of you involved at all like, with communities in terms of like elected officials or planning board or conservation advisory council volunteers? Um, well, that's a great way to learn about what your community is doing about things like wetlands. I'll talk more about that later. Um, we're also working on conservation, obviously, of fish, wildlife, and habitat, including like the signature fisheries in the river, like sturgeon and striped bass and um, uh, shad. In this case, um, this was uh, the crew out, and I got to volunteer that day, pulling up um, a haul saying nets for sturgeon, for sturgeon monitoring in the river, uh, tagging them and tracking them. Um, but we also work on wildlife and habitat conservation in the watershed of the Hudson River. So I'll talk a little bit about the watershed in a moment. But um, we're really trying to emphasize that the communities in the watershed all have these tremendous resources. And if we help them learn about where those resources are and why they're important and what the tools are to protect them, we can have kind of a very holistic approach to conservation in the region. Um, we also have always worked, and, and including with partners like Scenic Hudson, on preservation of the river's natural scenery. These kind of you know, amazing views like you have here in the Hudson Highlands. And then finally, enhanced opportunities for education, um, for access to the river, for enjoyment. And we do that through a lot of our grant programs and trying to um, help communities establish boat launches, um, the great kayak, you know, um, boat houses like you have here at Long Dock. Um, and also, we have staff working on education to try to help uh, residents of the valley understand that they're part of the Hudson River watershed and um, and there's if any of you are involved in education or teaching there's a whole series of Hudson River curricula on our website for trying to help integrate Hudson River topics into uh, lesson plans um, uh, and at the school level and hopefully you know all of this collectively is working toward kind of our overall inspiration to live in such an amazing region so about the region oh that's interesting you can't really see there's some some features of the map that are lost on this but um that's never happened i've used this map many times um so um in any case what, what you can see if, if the blue is showing up i'm not sure why it's not but there's this is the, the hudson river flows along here um and these are the 10 counties that uh border the estuary part of the river 
the estuary, an estuary is a tidal river. So if you're not that familiar with this concept, um, the, the Hudson River flows from New York Harbor um, uh, you know, up through an, uh, a, a dam up at Tro Troy. Uh, and the Troy Dam is basically the extent of the tidal portion of the river. So that's 153 miles. And there's tides all the way up to the dam in Troy. And that leads to about two um, high tides and two low tides each day. And the salt front, uh, basically the extent of the salt, the most salty part of the river, is usually around the Tapan Sea. In um, the summer, it might go as far north as Newburgh, and in drought conditions, maybe as far as Poughkeepsie. But as a result, we get real diversity of habitats in, within the river itself, because we have everything from salty wetlands to um, brackish wetlands, and then further north, freshwater uh, wetlands, all um, receiving tidal influence. So it creates a really different dynamic kind of habitat than the freshwater wetlands that are inland, which I'm going to really focus on uh, this evening. The other thing I wanted to point out is there's about 60 tributary streams that flow from the watershed into the river. And this green boundary is delineating the drainage basin for the Hudson River estuary, so just the tidal portion of the river. All that land flows, you know, ultimately, um, the water that moves across the land ultimately flows into the, the estuary portion of the Hudson River. And so that's why we feel it's really important to engage landowners, community decision makers, community leaders throughout the watershed, because really anything that occurs on the landscape that um, you know, can affect the water flowing into the tributaries, the water flowing into the river. So that's why we take this very holistic ecosystem approach to um, the estuary program. So I'm hoping, because you came out on this cold night, how many of you think wetlands are important? All right. How many of you feel like you really are confident about knowing what a wetland is? We're going to talk about that a little bit. OK, a couple. And then, and then more importantly, too, how many of you feel confident about the, you know, the approaches we have um, to conserving wetlands? All right, good. Well, hopefully when you leave tonight, you'll feel a little bit more confident about how to conserve and protect wetlands. Um, and this is a, one of my favorite pictures. This is some family members uh, at the Bashakill Wetland. If you any of you been there in Orange County, it's um, kind of like it's west of Middletown. It's a beautiful, huge state preserved wetland. And um, just the size of it always makes me appreciate the water storage capabilities of wetlands. It's a ton of water there. And the wildlife are, you know, are just it's an amazing place to just walk or go boating. Um, and we always go the day after a holiday, so I feel like all my photos are after Thanksgiving or Christmas when it always looks very gray and, <laughs> and dismal, but it's always a special place to go. So for tonight, I'm going to talk about what is a wetland, kind of take a tour of um, some of the wetlands that we have in the Hudson Valley because they're so diverse. I could spend hours just talking about any one of these one bullet points. Um, I'm going to talk about the value and functions of wetlands. Why should we care? Um, you know, wetlands get a bad rap about being mosquito breeding grounds frequently, and there's really so much more to them. Um, and then also kind of what, what we're concerned about in terms of the threats to wetlands. And then finally, what are some of the opportunities to conserve and protect wetlands? Okay, so for starters, what is a wetland? And when we talk about defining something in nature, I feel like it's a risky endeavor, but, um, but there's need to de define wetlands when we're thinking about establishing, say, legal protections for them. So we need to know what a wetland is. Um, if you're setting them academically, you want to know, you know, you might have different reasons to define a wetland. I'm going to focus on kind of the general um, approach to defining wetlands that's pretty um, universally used. And, and this is from the DEC's wetland, the, the Department of Environmental Conservation's website, that wetlands are areas saturated by surface or groundwater, um, sufficient enough to support distinctive vegetation adapted for life in saturated soil conditions. So there's three components of the definition that are important. The water aspect, the plants or vegetation that are growing there, and the soil types. And just to point out, the DEC's website does have a lot of great information about wetlands. Um, and um, uh, there's information both on freshwater wetlands, as I mentioned, and tidal wetlands. I'm going to focus tonight on, on freshwater wetlands. Um, but so getting to these three components, number one is the, the water aspect of it, or the hydrology. You know, hydro being water, um, uh, and hydrology is the study of water. And so in this case, we're studying kind of the water characteristics of a place on the landscape. And we look for indicators of water, um, not just um, like, you know, standing water that makes it very obvious, which would be, we would consider inundation, but also saturation. And the Army Corps of Engineers is the federal agency that uh, regulates wetlands at the federal level. And their definition um, considers um, there to be, um, uh, it to be a wetland if it's inundated or saturated 
5% of the growing season. So it's a small amount of time. The growing season around here, I think, is generally like maybe May to September, although it's been increasing with climate change in the last century. It's a longer growing season now. But so it's a small amount of time. So it doesn't mean that you need to walk up to a spot and see a lot of water and think, okay, this is a wetland. It could just be that it's saturated for just 5% of the growing season. In this case, do you recognize where this is, Anthony? Yeah, this is up at Black Creek Preserve, the Scenic Hudson Preserve, one of my favorite places to go look at vernal pools, which I'll talk about in a moment. But in this case, we can see water. Um, another, um, another characteristic that, that, um, of this definition is the soils. And when we talk about hydric soils, we're talking about wetland soils. And these are soils that um, have been developed under conditions where there's been prolonged um, saturation or flooding, enough that it's kind of created anaerobic conditions. And there's often a lot of organic matter. And so you can kind of see that uh, organic substrate up here. And this, this is a profile or, uh, of soils um, and the layers they developed. Uh, now, a lot of the soils, like I said, have organic material. And they're technically referred to as muck soils or peat soils. And uh, you know, if you are a gardener, you're quite familiar with getting um, very organic material to add, right? And, and if you were to grab a handful of muck from a wetland and pull it up and squeeze it, it'll drain water. because it's, like, it's like a sponge and it, that holds water. And I use the analogy of gardening because I live in a sand plain in Rosendale up in Ulster County. It's all sandy soil. So for me to garden successfully, I need to introduce organic material. And that's because if I poured water in my garden, it would just filter through the sand quickly. By introducing more of this organic kind of material, it's going to hold water long enough to nourish the plants. Um, and so you can understand when we think about wetlands as places that really hold on to water, it's through that sponginess of all that organic material in the soils that really enables it to do that. And in some places where these um, organic materials have um, developed and were collected over years and years and years, you could have, you know, up to, you know, the ceiling, just this all, you know, this mucky, peaty, um, uh, organic matter underneath the surface of the water, underneath the surface of the wetland. And then finally, it's the vegetation. Um, hydrophytic, um, hydro meaning water, phytic meaning loving. Hydrophytic vegetation, though, although I, I read somewhere that it's not that the vegetation are so much water loving, they're water tolerant. And I, I thought that was, uh, I made me think of Valentine's Day, but anyway, um, <laughs> um, I'm sure we could use that to describe other things. But in any case, um, hydrophytic vegetation is vegetation that is adapted to wet conditions. And so these are plants that can thrive in these low oxygen, wet, uh, you know, wet situations. And, um, and again, I'll draw an analogy to something you're probably familiar with, like if you are, have a house plant and you overwater it, um, a lot of times they don't do so well. Case in point, I had a poinsettia this winter. I put it somewhere that I don't normally have a house plant, so I kept forgetting about it. And whenever I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that plant's not doing well. And I kept adding water without actually seeing if it needed water. Until one day, I'm like, this plant is still not doing well. I went to lift it up, and the, you know, the, like the foil that they put around the base of the poinsettias was just like loaded with water. So the plant just died. And that's because that was not a plant that was adapted to wet conditions. Um, and so these plants that um, basically have evolved to thrive in these, in these places, you know, they wouldn't, like skunk cabbage in this photo, they wouldn't do well in an upland meadow or an upland um, forest, for example. They really need those conditions. And if you were to take a plant that thrives in an upland forest and plant it here, if it's, a, you know, if it's not tolerant of wet conditions, it won't thrive. So, um, so when you have this suite of three conditions, the hydrology, the wet, you know, the, the water conditions, the soil conditions, and the plant conditions all adding up to, you know, um, indicate you have a wetland, that's kind of how we define a wetland when we're out in the field and trying to determine if something actually is a wetland. Um, so another really important point is that no two wetlands are alike. And I just want you to kind of embrace this idea that we just have so much diversity in the Hudson Valley. Um, you know, in the state of New York, the Hudson Valley in particular is, um, we have more biodiversity, more diversity of life than other parts of New York State. It's really tremendous. And the reason is, you know, when we think about even standing here in Beacon, we have everything from the ridge tops of the Hudson Highlands down to say like, you know, where I just came from, the Wallkill River um, floodplains, these low bottomland flood, you know, floodplain um, riverside areas. And we have everything in between. You know, we also have the Catskill Mountains in the Hudson Valley. We have the Rensselaer Plateau up north, which is almost like an Adirondack type um, environment in terms of the elevation, because it's a plateau. And so when we think about all these different parts of the Hudson Valley, it creates all different conditions, and that enables us to see a really variety of habitats on the landscape. And so just when we think about Hudson Valley habitats, um, we have everything from wet meadow types to um, marsh and, and vernal pools and bogs, 
um, different kind of forested wetlands like swamps, uh, and, and, and even small, small significant, maybe seemingly insignificant things like this photo here, which was a CP area uh, in the woods. And then we also have, and I just want to point this out because, as I said, I'll be talking more about this kind of uh, group of wetlands, these freshwater non-tidal wetlands. We also have a diversity of tidal wetlands in, in the estuary. Um, everything from the, the habitats that are more down south in the saltier uh, uh, reaches of the river, things like salt marshes and the estuarine rocky shores. And then as we move up to the more brackish, uh, where we have salt and freshwater uh, mixing, we have brackish meadows and brackish tidal marshes. And then as we move further north above that salt front, we have uh, freshwater tidal wetlands. When I first moved to this area, I couldn't get my head around how somebody could be freshwater and tidal, because I never lived on an estuary before. And, 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 but actually, these are so uncommon that the freshwater tidal wetlands that we have in the Hudson River have, globally, um, have global significance, basically, because they're, they just don't occur globally very, um, in very many places. So, um, and, you know, and, and you can imagine, for example, the plants that are adapted to live in a salt marsh probably wouldn't be able to live in a freshwater mudflat. And so that's why when we have all these kinds of different habitat types with all these different sets of conditions, each with their own flora and fauna. That's what how it kind of helps us have all this diversity of life in the Hudson Valley. It's really amazing. So I wanted to kind of take a little tour of a few examples of some of the different kinds of freshwater wetlands we have here, right in the Hudson Valley. All these photos I took, um, you know, in this, in, in this probably from Putnam County and, and um, Orange County, York, up to Albany and Rensselaer County. So when you look, if you were to walk along to this spot, tell me what you are observing in this spot, looking at this photo. Anything? Grasses. Grasses, yes. Right, so we'll start with that. There's no tree canopy. And when we try to define things in nature, you know, there's a number of characteristics we look at. And so with wetlands, in this case, one of the things that's significant is there's, there's no tree canopy. This is what would be considered an open wetland. Um, any particular plant you're noticing? Something purple? Purple loosestrife, yeah. Purple loosestrife, which is a beautiful plant, but it's also an invasive plant that um, will take over wetlands, which is why it looks beautiful, because when you come across a big, wet, purple area, you know, it's pretty um, impressive. But actually, it's an invasive plant. But so in this wet meadow, oh, I gave it away. It's, this is a wet meadow. Um, uh, in this wet meadow, we can see um, there's a lot of grasses. There, um, so in wet meadows, you'll have um, what are called herbaceous plants, non-woody plants. And um, in this case, we see purple loosestrife, a lot of sedges and grasses, a lot of different wildflowers. And these are all, again, plants that are um, um, wetland indicator plants. If you were to walk on this, you might not, or even walk by it, say, you might think, oh, this is just a meadow or hay field or something like that and not recognize it's wet. But if you were to walk in it, you would feel the lumpiness that you feel in wetlands um, because some of the plants kind of lift their roots up a little bit just for when their water levels fluctuate and um, you'll feel lumpiness. It also might be that when you step, water kind of oozes up, but they're generally not standing water. And wet meadows are important for a number of species, um, especially a lot of our invertebrates, a lot of um, insects, butterflies, moths, things like that. And, and often what grows here will determine what insects are here. And one great example is um, the Baltimore uh, butterfly. This is the larval um, uh, or caterpillar stage of the Baltimore butterfly. And when they are in this stage, they're one of their favorite host plants what, what hosts the larval plant, what they prefer to eat, is this beautiful native wildflower, white turtle head. And because these are supposed to look like little turtle heads, if you have the imagination, um, that's how it got its name. And so in wet meadows where there's a lot of white turtle head, you could um, predict that you're probably going to see a lot of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, which is beautiful. Um, and, and so um, th that, that relationship, again, about diversity, you know, the, the kind of wetland it is determines the kind of plants that can grow there, and depending on the plants that are there, it determines the uh, wildlife you might see. Um, other, other animals that would use a meadow include um, a lot of amphibians, like this pickerel frog, a uh, bog turtle, which is a um, uh, uh, threatened and endangered species. They actually like a particular kind of wet meadow that is um, called a fen, which is uh, a calcareous or calcium-rich uh, groundwater-fed meadow. So it has to have all those kinds of conditions in order for it to be right for a bog turtle. So again, no two wetlands are the same. They all, you know, they have different suites of characteristics that um, are really important to the wildlife that are there. And then, I always say, I hate to pick favorites when it comes to wildlife, but one of my absolute favorites, does anybody know this great looking bird? 
It's a woodcock, yeah. And it's actually a shore, it's in the shorebird family, but it's a forest species. And, um, and this long bill is used for um, probing the soil for earthworms. So really it's more of a forest um, species and you can imagine this um, uh, kind of would help it camouflage, its feathers would help it camouflage in the, on the forest floor when there's brown dead leaves. But they, dis they do these beautiful displays in the, um, actually coming up soon, like late March, early April, to attract the females. The males do this awesome um, uh, aerial display where they fly up in the spiral pattern really high and then they drop down. And, and anyway, woodcock is a great example of a species that needs a complex of habitats. It does its courtship and breeding in, these, uh, in meadows, often wet meadows, um, but then it lives in the forest. So again, just you know, the diversity of life we have here in the Hudson Valley is amazing. Now here's another example of a wetland type. Um, what, can you tell me about this one maybe that's different from the previous? Right, there's open water. So now we have no forest. I mean, I'm talking about this area here, you know, below the, of the you know, in front of the trees. But it's, it's, uh, there's no um, tree canopy again. It's another type of open wetland. But in this case, unlike the meadow, the wet meadow, we actually have areas of standing and open water mixed in with plants like cattails. And there's actually purple loosestrife in here, probably some reed canary grass. And this is what we call an emergent marsh. Um, you probably heard the term marsh. A lot of people use some of these terms without knowing what they mean. Like they just call any old wetland a marsh or they call any old wetland a swamp. There's actually technical definitions for these. And in this case, emergent is referring to the plants having merged from the water surface. Um, so this is an emergent marsh. This is right in New Paltz. You might recognize Sky Top up on the Shandong Ridge in Moh at Mohang. And emergent, here's, a, oh, now this is another uh, photo of an emergent marsh. And this is in the Bashakel wetland, again, the one I showed earlier in Orange County. And marshes are extremely important for a lot of our wading birds. In fact, there's, um, and I knew I would remember the number, um, there's, I think, about four species, um, five species in New York that are actually state listed. Um, like black rail is endangered, pie billed grebe, which um, this little guy, which again is one of my favorites, um, is, a, is, a di uh, uh, is a small duck that is also, um, uh, it's endangered in the state or threatened in the state. Um, American bittern, which is uh, this photo here, is a, spe a species of special concern. Uh, least bittern is another bittern that's um, uh, listed. So the, the marsh birds really rely on this kind of habitat, and they're, as in general, they're kind of declining, and they're very elusive, so it's actually hard to see them. I mean, great blue heron is the one that we see most frequently, is most common and widespread, but um, it, you know, having these large expanse of marshes are really important for this group of wildlife species. Okay, now something different's happening. What do we have in this picture now that's been different from the others? Trees. Trees, right. So now we have a forest canopy, and this is what we would call a hardwood swamp. So swamp is actually technical, you know, there's technical understanding that that word means a, um, uh, a wetland with a forest um, canopy. It could be sh or, or shrub, shrubby or, um, or trees. In this case, we have a typical red maple swamp, and we have these um, what are called um, hummocks or tussocks where you have those kind of mounds of plants that have pulled themselves up a little bit out of the water, and that enables them to be able to tolerate the conditions even when it becomes a little bit more flooded. And sometimes they'll, they'll maybe standing water in the swamp. Sometimes, in this case, there was a little bit of um, a stream kind of flowing through it. But um, there's a, now a, a different group of species that likes um, swampy areas. Like this one is a mix of, of um, maples as well as uh, more shrubs. And typical shrubs of wetlands include things like um, high bush blueberry, Azalea, which is beautiful, um, spice bush, um, uh, winterberry, you know, shrubs like that. And species that like, you know, swamps um, include things like this uh, gray tree frog. You know, when, when we see areas that have become flooded, the trees often start to die and they create these um, little microhabitats of these hollowed out trees and things like gray tree frogs will be calling from them. But um, a number of other species like um, uh, some of the woodpeckers like the cavities that are developed in these dead dying trees and prothonotary warbler is a species that again when you just think about the connections between what the species needs and what's there in the habitat it just we really need to maintain a diversity in the landscape because in the case of this warbler i think it's a good example they're primarily insect eaters and we know wet areas often have a lot of insects and they like to nest in cavities and trees that are not too high up off the water surface so they really need these swampy areas and then red-shouldered hawk is a species of, of um, special concern in New York State, and they also like large expanses of forest and forested wetlands, often along streams. And um, uh, they're just a be beautiful hawk. 
And then finally, I'm going to end on just one more example. And um, and anybody know what this is? I mentioned one earlier. This is what we call uh, a woodland pool or a vernal pool. You might be familiar with that term. And I've, I've spent a lot of time um, learning about and teaching about woodland pools because I think they're kind of um, um, an often ignored habitat that's really a very important one. And it's really been great to see it, like at least in the, I've been in my position at the Ashbury program for, this will be my 10th year. And, um, and really just there's been a lot of interest about woodland pools over the last decade, which is really great. So um, woodland pools or, or vernal pools are um, a small depression. It could be you know, just the size of this building. Um, they're generally about a quarter acre. And they're uh, an, a basin of water that's pretty much isolated. There's not a stream flowing continuously in and out. So they're, they're not getting a continuous flow of water. Um, normally, they're in these little basins. Like you can see here, the slope uh, above it, that kind of continues around it if you were to see an aerial view of this. And so it's kind of a micro watershed. So all the snow melt and the rainwater that flows down these slopes collects in this little basin. And usually, like you can see here, this is late winter when I took this photo. Between, um, uh, you know, between the snow melt and spring rains, that's when they generally fill up and they have a lot of water in them. And they might hold water uh, until like July, August, depending on the year. Now the fact that there's no stream flow, there's not continuous water, and they dry up, what's, what animal is missing? Fish. Fish can't really survive. In most vernal pools, a typical vernal pool that dries up every year, every couple of years, fish can't live because they dry up. As a result, they're awesome breeding habitat for our forest amphibians. And um, you know, a lot of people think amphibians, forest, you know, amphibians are in wet places. There's actually a whole group of beautiful amphibians that live in the forest, and they only move to these pools to breed in about late March, early April. And um, they, they make long journeys to get to these um, pools from the forest. And they stay there for maybe you know, a week. Or they, you know, they, they do these courtship rituals, depending on the, on the species. Um, and then they, they lay their eggs, and they leave. And they go back out into the forest. And the eggs are left there to develop into tadpoles or salamander larvae. Um, and, um, and then they eventually hatch. And then they all need to develop their legs and crawl out back into the forest before it dries up. So it's really an amazing um, evolution, and the life cycles of these amphibians are so closely tied to these pools. And these are one of the habitats that I worry that climate change is really going to mess up this very tenuous relationship with um, precipitation. Because if we have more intense storms, if we have droughts, things like that, it's really going to change the hydrology of these pools and really affect probably the ability for them to be good breeding habitat. So here's a close-up of, you know, they're not very deep, they're often maybe just a meter or, or so. Um, but here's one of the species of spotted salamander. This is one of the more common vernal pool breeding um, amphibians we have in the, in the Hudson Valley. And, you know, they're, they can be about this long. I, every spring I say, ooh, I forgot how big they are when I first see my first one of the year. They're just a really little, they're great, they're big. Um, they're probably like, you know, seven, eight inches long. And um, that's the wind. Wow, um, and um, uh, so, and they're very related. You know, they're very um, similar to um, Jefferson salamander and blue spotted salamander. And those three are called the mole salamanders, um, not to be confused with the mole salamander, which is a different species. But they're called mole salamanders because they really spend a lot of time under the um, forest floor in the um, at the burrows of small mammals. And so that's why, you know, I, when I first learned about these, I said, how did I not know about these? Like, I spent so much time in the woods as a kid, and, um, I mean, you know, when I wasn't in New Jersey. But um, uh, I never saw them. It's really because they're underground, and you don't really see them until they come out at night, and they're, you know, hunting around within the, the leaf litter on, on the forest floor. And then um, they really come out in mass during their migrations to uh, vernal pools, which I'll actually talk about in a minute. Another species that lives in the forest that you might be familiar with are wood frogs. And this is another species that relies on vernal pools for breeding. And um, many people, I find, are more familiar with the sound of them than actually having seen them. The males uh, uh, have a call to attract females to the pools in the spring. And a lot of people, when I play this, they'll say, oh, yeah, I've heard that. I never knew what it was. In fact, um, a really great biologist that I worked for for many years told me when he first heard this when he was younger, he thought it was ducks. And he was walking around the woods trying to find ducks, and he couldn't find them. He found eventually, he found the frogs. 
I just love that. I feel like people say the robin is the harbinger of spring, but like when I hear that, that's when I know you know spring is arriving. Right? I mean, those are some exciting mouse. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then another important species uh, that relies on this wet and dry cycle of vernal pools are fairy shrimp, which are an invertebrate species that uh, requires, um, in, in their life cycle, they create um, a cyst for their egg, and that egg has to, you know, basically dry, has to be in a dry condition and then inundated for it to hatch. So um, they're really neat. They, they swim with their gills up, so you see this little fluttering. They're very tiny. I mean, they're not, you're not going to make scampi out of them. These fairy shrimp, but um, but anyway, there again, there's something that's very tightly tied to the, the habitat conditions that it's in. So um, I started a project about six years ago at the DEC that um, was a, a chance to get people aware of this com complex relationship between the forests and breeding pools of these amphibians, and it's called the Amphibian Migration and Road Crossing Project. And there's handouts on the table if you're interested in learning more or volunteering. You know, take, this, take the, um, the fact sheet and, and go to our website. But the idea is that a lot of these species, they're traveling long distances, and they often need to travel across roads or driveways. And it's a high-risk environment for a small creature that's traveling a long distance. And often, you know, they've basically been underground, kind of, um, I mean, in the case of wood frogs, frozen underground for the winter. And what triggers this migration to the pools, because, again, they need to get in there, breed, you know, get their, um, their, their eggs hatched and their young out in order to survive before it dries up. So they need to get in there as early as possible. And um, people call this whole process like the race against dryness, right? This whole process. They're just trying to get their whole uh, reproduction done before the pool dries out. So what triggers their migration is when the ground has thawed, evening temperatures are reaching 40 degrees, and, it, and you get that first, like, heavy rain in the spring. And when all those things line up perfectly, we get what's called a big night, when they migrate in huge numbers. I mean, hundreds, if not thousands. And this is a phenomenon that happens throughout the Northeast. And I eventually learned that programs from Maine to New Jersey had volunteer programs where they went out, and they often knew where there were locations where hundreds might be crossing from this big forest area to Vernal Pools. And because they're slow moving, and it's cold, and they're not moving real fast, um, especially because of the cold, they're getting hit by cars, and there's a lot of mortality. And there's many things that are threatening amphibians globally that I feel like are out of our control. But this is something that we can actually do something about. And so this is a chance for volunteers. And that's what all these folks are doing. They're getting out and they're moving them, recording what they see. We have a data form. It's very straightforward and simple. And what's nice about this is there aren't like 30 species to learn. It's not like learning, you know, warbler species when during birding, you know, birding um, uh, bird migrations in the spring. There's only about like you know, maybe 10 species you'll encounter, and they're very easy to learn to identify. So um, anyway, so there's more information about that. But basically, what happens is they come out of the ground on these rainy nights, and they make this long trek to the pools. And like I said, then they'll stay there for a while. And when they return to the forest, it's not that same kind of explosive migration because they don't need to rush back to the forest. They can, you know, they might go in different times depending on when it's raining and so forth. But it happens at night. It's cold and it's raining, so I understand it's not the ideal volunteer conditions. Not to mention, we can't schedule it because it just when it happens. It happens. So our volunteers, I would say they're the best volunteers because they're flexible, you know, they're willing to be spontaneous and they're willing to deal with rainy, wet conditions. And um, the website and the fact sheet also talks a little bit about the importance of taking safety precautions, which is why everybody's dressed in orange vests and um, wearing, you know, headlamps. And it's also really important to be safe when handling amphibians and have clean hands that are wet and not doesn't have, you know, don't have any um, lotions or anything like that because the sensitivity of the skin of the amphibians is we're trying to protect them, not hurt them. Okay, so now I want to take some time to talk a little bit about the value and functions of wetlands. In addition to all those wildlife values, why else should we care about wetlands? So I could talk for hours just about this. Um, you know, they wetlands help maintain so many um, what we call ecosystem services, community benefits that we receive from from nature. Things like clean water and flood control, uh, erosion control. Groundwater recharge. How many of you are you, most of you Beacon City residents? Do any of you have wells? Um, drink from well water. I know I drink from well water, and that's you know things like groundwater recharge are really important when you have even municipal drinking water wells or personal like home wells. Um, pollution reduction, um, you know, from in terms of water filtration, as well um, as wildlife habitat recreation and so forth. So here's a really simple little schematic that shows how wetlands. So this is a wetland here how they're kind of hydrologically connected. 
um, to the surrounding landscape. So in this case, if we were to look at surface water, what's flowing on the surface, we have a stream coming down a slope and it's kind of hitting a level area where there's a wetland forming. If there's a lot of energy in the stream and it's flowing quickly, especially after a heavy rainstorm, when it hits that wetland, it has a chance to slow down. The wetland is a broad, flat area. It can hold the water. And again, as I told you, that, that um, organic material like peat and muck, that can store the water. So the, the wetland holds water, and then it can slowly seep into the ground. And it gives it a chance to, um, to um, uh, kind of to slow and control flood water. And when we think about more intense storms um, with, with the future of climate change, wetlands play such an important role in, in, in trying to um, uh, mitigate the, the uh the, you know, the, the mitigate the effects of flooding, the risk of flooding. There's a really great, about 10 minute video if you're interested, I think it was done by the Conservation Law Fund. And it's, um, it was, it's, uh, it's, looks at in Vermont, I forget the name of the stream, how two communities fared after Irene based on the flooding that happened from this creek. Howard Dean uh, narrates it. I'm sure you could Google on a number of these uh, <laughs> things I am remembering. And it's a great video because it really shows how the community that had more wetlands upstream had less um, damage from flooding because the broad wet, uh, floodplain captured, um, and, you know, the wetlands in this broad floodplain kind of captured all that water that was rushing down and slowed it down. And when it finally got into the community that was downstream, that community didn't see the same kind of damage that another community on the same um, creek did see because they didn't have the, the opportunity for wetlands to protect them from flood water. And so when we work with municipalities, whether it be the city of Beacon, um, you know, the town of Newburgh, wherever, we're trying to encourage um, municipal decision makers to protect the wetlands that they still have and to restore the ones that maybe have been degraded because they really are important for so many reasons, including things like um, flood water. But in addition to helping slow and control flood water, they also help control um, sediment. You know, the plants that are growing in a wetland, when water is moving through, and especially when you have, um, you know, fast moving water in a stream, kind of picking up sediment as it goes, when it hits that wetland, the sediment um, gets chopped and captured by the plants and the roots, and it has a chance to settle in so that the water that actually is leaving the wetland is cleaner than what maybe um, is entering it. And it's also cleaner because the bacteria that are in the wetland and the plants help to um, break down contaminants, absorb um, nutrients, and again, that helps contribute to the cleaner water leaving the wetland. Um, and um, I also wanted to point out, of course, too, that there's critical wildlife habitat. So many functions to wetlands. I wanted to give a great example of how um, we're learning, you know, many, many years ago, people thought wetlands were terrible mosquito breeding grounds. We need to fill them in and ditch them and drain them and let's get rid of them. And now, we, you know, uh, you know, thankfully, like in the late 60s, early 70s, people learned. We had a Clean Water Act. We started protecting wetlands because we recognized they had great value. And in many cases now, in some places, we're trying to restore wetlands that were lost. And I just think this is a good example of how the benefits of nature were lost and now they're trying to be restored. And this is up, um, uh, up in, by Lake George. I actually don't vacation in Lake George, but I guess there's a very popular swimming beach called the Million Dollar Beach. I don't know if any of you are familiar. Um, but it was um, being impacted by polluted stormwater that was basically flowing along um, Route 9. Uh, there was commercial strips, and you know the parking lots had oil and um, probably salt, and there was phosphorus and a whole bunch of things that were basically flowing every time it rained through these parking areas into this brook called the West Brook and then flowing out into Lake George and contaminating the water that was a very popular beach area. And you can imagine, that's probably tied to the economy of the region, right? Their people are coming in, they're spending money, they're vacationing there, they want a nice clean beach and good water to swim in. So what they're doing is they're restoring a whole area of wetland um, that will then now, and this is an area that was wetlands, they're putting them back um, to filter the water before it enters Lake George. So this is a, kind of an overview of what that schematic looks. Here's, I think this is Route 9, and if you can imagine Lake George is over here, and what's going to happen now is they've constructed a series of wetlands and they're having the water flow through. Um, it says stormwater from Route 9 uh, will flow into a settling pond, which will kind of allow sediment to drop out. But then it's going to move through um, a shallow marsh where vegetation will help to pull out the nutrients that can harm the lake. And then water will flow into one of two different wetlands um, for further sediment treatment and nutrient removal, and then eventually flow out into, um, the, into the lake. So they've spent millions of dollars to restore what had previously been there and was doing a great job at restoring or at maintaining clean water. And so again, you know, wetlands are more than just 
um, uh, a feature on the landscape. They really do an amazing amount of work that we benefit from. I already mentioned flood control, um, but just wanted to point out the statistic that the uh, Environmental Protection Agency has estimated that one acre of wetlands can hold one to one and a half million gallons of water. And that's important because a lot of small wetlands are not protected legally anyway, and we can lose cumulatively a lot of small wetlands. And when we do, we lose the ability to hold a lot of flood water, which is so important when we think about intensity of storms and things like that, snow melt. And um, I often like to bring in this economist viewpoint because I'm a biologist and obviously I love wetlands. Um, but this was a report done by the New York State Comptroller, Thomas DiNapoli, about five, six years ago. And it was a report on the economic benefits of open space preservation. Open space meaning the undeveloped areas like forests and fields and wetlands. And in this report, he said, in many instances, it is less expensive for a community to maintain open space that naturally maintains water quality, reduces runoff, controls flooding, than to use tax dollars for engineering these costly systems that um, um, that would do that, you know, provide that service, um, things like water filtration plants and storm sewers. So, um, you know, we all can be um, uh, involved in the process of land use decision making in our communities, and if we're concerned that our local towns or cities or villages are, um, you know, slowly chipping away at the wetland resources we have, we can speak up about that. And there's a lot of reports that show, both environmentally, economically, they're really valuable to our communities. And then I've already, you know, talked about the value of the wildlife habitat. But just wanted to point out, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that up to 43% of the threatened and endangered species in the U.S. are directly or uh, indirectly um, dependent on wetlands for their survival. And approximately one half, of all, one half of all North American bird species nest or feed in wetlands. So what should we worry about? I don't know why I'm forgetting how to remote control. Um, what are the threats to wetlands um, that we need to worry about? I just, I don't want to, you know, spend too much time on the negativity, so I just put this all in one slide. But things like hydrologic alterations, right, the way we fill, um, uh, we might fill or drain wetlands. This is a road I used to live on, and there's all these little wet um, uh, woods all along the road. And every year, the local road department would come and improve the ditches, right, when they would just come and scrape away and fill. Well, this, this was a result. This was, you know, I mean, this is a very small well, and it's right next to a road, so it's probably pretty pretty um, impact already. But putting all this fill in was not helping at all. Basically, this, you know, this little uh, skunk cabbage, um, little forest wetland came right up to the road. They dumped all the stuff in here. And let me tell you what happened when it rained. That um, eroded into this little creek, which flowed down. There's a culvert here, flowed down to a stream further down. And I happen to know the stream was a wood turtle stream. And it was all full of sediment. But those are the kinds of, you know, this is a small scale example. When we do things like this in a, a big way, we can have impacts that affect the quality of these, uh, these habitats. Things like pollutants, obviously, runoff, um, stormwater runoff. When we talk about stormwater runoff, I'm talking about things like rainfall hitting parking lots, all that water having nowhere to go but you know, flowing into the landscape uh, without being treated. Also, inadequate wetland buffers. Um, New York State uh, protects, for the wetlands it can protect, it, it adds 100 feet of adjacent area. Actually, we know that um, ecologically, wetlands do best when they have even a bigger buffer than that. And the idea is that that buffer area, first of all, it's good for the ecology of the system, but it also helps filter anything that's entering into the wetlands. And invasive species are another threat to wetlands. Um, and I want to point out, not all wetlands are protected. So a lot of times when I talk to communities, I'll hear back, well, why should we worry about wetlands at our local you know, community level? New York State protects wetlands, right? The DEC protects wetlands. The Army Corps of Engineers protect wetlands. Actually, that's, um, uh, it's not entirely true. Not all wetlands are protected. So in New York State, the way the law was written, wetlands that are over 12.4 acres, or five hectares, those are what the DEC is, is uh, authorized to protect. And so um, before I worked at the DEC office and I was working in the nonprofit world, I often said, why isn't the DEC doing more to protect wetlands? The DEC can only do what it's authorized to do that's based on the law. And, and so, um, so it's authorized to protect wetlands that are 12.4 acres or larger, as well as small wetlands that have been designated of unusual local importance. And that there's a whole set of criteria that to, in order to get that designation. The Army Corps of Engineers, the federal government level, protects wetlands that are um, what are called um, uh, connected to navigable waterways. Navigable meaning you can put a boat in it and move along. It could be small, you know, a small creek even. 
But um, so it's a lot of the river um, and creek side wetlands that are protected by the Army Corps. So what does that mean? So when the legislation changed for the Army Corps protection some years back, my colleagues did a little bit of the map analysis, the GIS analysis, to figure out, well, which wetlands would be left unprotected if we only protect the DEC wetlands and these wetlands that are connected to navigable waterways? What does that leave? All these small isolated vernal pools, for example, small wet meadows, things like that. And in some counties, it was over 50% of the wetlands in the county that would be unprotected. So what does that mean? Landowners can help protect wetlands. Local communities can create their own laws to protect wetlands. You know, they can do um, create open space plans. There's a whole bunch of different ways um, communities and land trusts and landowners and residents can get involved in wetland protection. And in fact, the Center for Watershed Protection, who does a lot of policy analysis um, on, on water resources, they also wrote a report that, I just thought this was a telling kind of conclusion, that development in urban as well as rural areas now is the cause of more than 60% of national wetland loss. Several assessments have noted deficiencies in current federal and state regulatory programs, and these gaps can best be closed by increased local management and regulation of wetlands. And we're lucky. I mean, the Hudson Valley, right, we're at the birthplace of the environmental movement, but by, you know, by Storm King Mountain. And... Um, um, but fortunately, a lot of people pay attention, but there's still a lot of people who need to be educated, and, and that's part of why I come out and talk about wetlands, but I think, you know, everybody who's here can talk to other people about wetlands and, and share some of the resources that are available on the web and, and so forth. So what are the opportunities for conserving wetlands so that, um, that people, you know, younger generations have wetlands to enjoy um, when they're older? What can your community can do? So just you know, learn like you're doing tonight, but also educate others, as I said. I mean, conservation often happens one conversation at a time, and um, and, and getting people out and, um, you know, going to places like Sandy Hudson's Black Creek um, Preserve and looking at vernal pools or participating in, in um, the public programs that a lot of um, nonprofits and nature centers hold every year to get out and, you know, go bird and go down to Constitution Marsh, which is the Audubon site that has the boardwalk right out into a beautiful tidal marsh, and there's just so many opportunities to get out and enjoy these places, but also bring people who maybe are less enlightened or don't care as much um, to do that as well. Um, practicing good stewardship if you're a landowner. And um, you know, I used to teach this um, program called the Biodiversity Assessment Training. And it was a chance to teach people how to use maps and air photos to predict and learn about the location of important habitat. And there was a retired engineer and farmer from Dutchess County, and he had a beautiful land. And he said, um, He's like, it wasn't until I took that course that I realized all my efforts for all these years of filling and draining the wetlands on my property, I didn't know I had a kettle shark pool, which is blending turtle habitat, and he had these like amazing wetlands, but he just didn't know. And so education is so important because now as a result, he knows not to dig, you know, not to dredge, not to fill, not to mow right up to the edges of a wetland, you know, let the natural vegetation grow around a wetland. Um, you know, the, the Hudson River Estuary Program um, has a, a, another program called Trees for Tribs, Trees for Tributaries. My colleague Beth Ressler runs that, and that's a program to help communities plant trees and shrubs to increase buffer areas along streams. But it's equally important to do that around wetlands, too, if, if there's um, uh, you know, not really enough natural vegetation around a wetland. Also, locating and mapping wetlands. A lot of times, um, the map resources that we use to know where wetlands are were done decades ago when the technology wasn't as good, when we, don't have, we didn't have GIS, we didn't have good air photos. I mean, yeah, you go on Bing, Online, I mean, you can see what you're wearing if you happen to be in the photo the day they took the photo. It's like the, the definition and the clarity is so good. That's not what was used to develop a lot of the wetland maps that are available to um, land managers and decision makers today. And so a lot of community groups like this one and, and, and here in the town of Summers, they've actually learned techniques and have gone out to do mapping um, as volunteers so that there are better resources to know where wetlands are. So if a big development project, for example, is proposed or new roads go in, you know, decisions can be made that take into account those resources. We call it natural resource-based planning, where you plan for future growth around the resources that we know are there, and the important piece is there is that we know they're there, and oftentimes it takes some work to know to know what's there. And then finally, I already mentioned that there's policy and planning options that can be pursued at the community level to um, to find out, you know, or to to better conserve and protect wetlands. And if you want to know what your community is doing about wetlands. You know, show up at a town board meeting, show up at an environmental commission meeting. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about all that, you know, after we're done here. Um, we work a lot with local governments in Hudson Valley. So, it's about time to wrap up. So I just wanted to, there's four things you leave with tonight. 
Um, one is that just to celebrate that there's such a variety of wetlands in the region. You know, when people talk about the possible impact to a wetland when there maybe is a big development project, and we say, well, that's okay, we're going to fill that one in, but we're going to build another one over here. We can, we're fooling ourselves to think we could ever replicate what nature has created. I mean, we might have a wetland that's fed by groundwater flowing through alkaline bedrock, and so it's creating a pH condition that certain plants like to grow in, and, you know, and it dries up part of the year. I mean, there's all these different conditions. If we think we can just build something to replicate that, we're fooling ourselves. And often what we see when we see constructed wetlands is like a pond with a ring of cattail around it. So, um, so celebrate that there's a variety of wetlands, and that's why we have such biodiversity in the region. Also that wetlands have tremendous value. They're not just mosquito breeding grounds. They really provide so many services we benefit from at the human, human community level. Um, things like flood control, but also wildlife habitat. Many wetlands are unprotected, um, and there are, so there are things we can do at the local community and personal level to try to make sure that we don't lose the wetlands we have left. And finally, just that, um, that uh, local communities do have many ways, um, there's many resources available to try to up the protection of wetlands. And, and more and more too, I mean, even with our program, we have an, a grants program for communities that want to develop things like open space plans to try to find mechanisms to conserve these resources. So with, I mean, you know, and, and if you want to end on a philosophical note, um, you know, Aldo Leopold had said, uh, what to protect every cog and wheel is the first um, step toward intelligent tinkering. You know, when we tinker with the landscape, we want to save every one of those cog and wheel. We don't know, you know, what, what happens when we remove one thing or, um, a, a, you know, a set of habitats from the landscape or a set of species. So it's really in our best interest to kind of think about being more proactive about protecting these resources. So I'm going to end there because it's been an hour, but I also will take questions if anybody has any. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I've yeah. noticed in a lot of developments, especially the newer developments, you know, where they're putting something like a big condo in town. Right. But they are taking into account some of this, uh, you know, uh, what you're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. conserving or creating new wetlands from all the runoff that's going to happen now. And what they call them now are retention. Detention basins, right, detention, right, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, you know, I guess it's it's, it's, it's it's a lot better than what it used to be. Well, and that's, that's a little different, I mean, in terms, so that's, um, the, the, there's a lot of required stormwater practices, and the idea there is that when you're building a new development, you don't want to end up um, with the stormwater leaving the site. So in the past, right, you said there, there have been improvements. In the past, you know, so say you had a large grassy area. Whatever water was hitting that grass probably was trickling down into the groundwater or slowly running off. When you put rooftops for 100 condos and parking areas, now it's happening. Water's hitting that, and it's moving quickly, probably into a storm drain where it's piped away, and the, that area has now lost that water resource. So, right, so they're building features on the, the land or on the site to try to hold on to the water. Um, and it's also called green infrastructure. So there's new green infrastructure practices to try to... Um, improve just the, maybe just, instead of just having a detention basin that holds water, instead creating something like a rain garden or a grassy swale or something that has vegetation. So you're, you're not actually creating like a, a real ecologically functioning wetland, but you're creating something that uses the, um, the benefits of these natural areas and kind of, uh, you know, to, to try to treat the water naturally, slow it down. And it might not provide great wildlife habitat because sometimes these areas are catching all the polluted water. Um, but they're instead kind of using what we've learned from nature to try to slow down and, and, and treat the water a little bit. Yeah, that's a great point. So yeah, think, and, then, and then even in more advanced um, uh, you know, thinking projects, they're doing things like green roofs, right? Um, uh, you guys don't have any projects with green roofs, do you? Is any Hudson? Do you know? I know the Culinary Institute, I think, of, uh, in High Park has a green roof. But that's where you're actually creating a living roof, so that's really helping um, with some of the water that would normally just be hitting, you know, shingles and flowing off. So I'm glad you brought up something positive. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so much as like with the big night and how all these different communities kept to having different like, surface currents of wood and how um, next year's going to change. Mm -hmm. So with the winter like this, where we've had farm temperatures and now it's really cold, right? And So the question is about, you know, vernal pool amphibians. We haven't had snow, so there's not snow melt that's going to melt 
um, it's been warm, you know, how sensitive are they to those kinds of conditions? That's a great question, and we've been scratching our head wondering also what's going to happen this spring. And this, I, I'm forgetting if it's been six or seven years I've done the program. I think about four years in those six years, it was like textbook conditions where they've been really dry, and all of a sudden it just warmed up, and we got these incre incredible rains, and it was really easy for me to predict. Because what I do is I have an email list of about 500 people, you know, maybe you know a quarter of which actually go out, but they like to know when it's happening, and so I just remind people, it looks like the temperature's going to be right in three days, so get your secure ready, and, and, um, and you're welcome to sign up for that. My email is on the, um, the handout, and you can send me an email, and, and I'll put you on that list. And, and, um, um, but then two years, it was a really weird spring where it never felt like it was raining, and it, or if it rained, it was during the day, and it was never raining at night, and I think the migration happened very diffusely. So we, nobody really ever saw a big night. It was like, it seemed like they were, or they were moving maybe like three in the morning when nobody was out looking and hopefully there weren't cars on the road so they didn't need help anyway. But, um, so I don't know what's gonna happen this year. It's a big question. And um, I mean, I would, I think the ground has been probably, I mean, because it's been pretty cold at night even though we've had mild days. So I think the ground's probably frozen, um, but I don't know. And, and so that'll be, we'll find out this year what happens. I'm, I'm, my, I'm, my concern is definitely whether or not there's going to be enough water to fill the pools, and um, uh, we'll see how you know what happens with spring rains if that kind of a comp, you know compensates for the fact that we don't have any snowmelt. And then another species which I didn't even talk about, which is really fascinating, is marbled salamander, which is a black salamander with um, um, silver or white markings, and they're like little um, stout, they look pretty chubby, and they're really great. Um, but they evolved to um, and adapted and, and kind of took advantage uh, of this of the vernal pool system but they breed in the fall and so the females actually and, and the males go to the pools when it's dry or the, uh, uh, the I'm sorry, the female lays her eggs in the pool when it's dry at the kind of the edges of the pool and um, it's she doesn't want to lay them too low into the pool because then if we just get like a flash rain, it might inundate and they'll, they'll hatch prematurely and there's not enough water for them to live in. Um, and she doesn't want to do it, you know, lay them too high on the margin of the pool because then they maybe will never get inundated. So that's the trade-off. But the advantage is if everything goes well, her eggs are now in the pool when there's like a, in the fall when there's a high water table and there's some rain and they will, will persist under the ice over the winter. And when they, um, uh, you know, are, are active in the spring, they're bigger than the ones that are going to just be hatching that year from the spotted salamanders and the wood. So they have a leg up and they have a different, you know, they're, they're going to be feeding on something a little larger than the smaller guys. So that means that, you know, they're not as competitive for the food source as the just recently hatched spring um, salamander larvae. So it's kind of interesting. So sorry, I didn't mention that, but it's one more thing to make the vernal pools even more fascinating. So, um, yeah, but anyway, I'd be happy to, um, follow up by email if anybody's interested in that project. And there's lots of information on the website, which I haven't updated yet for this year, but there's a very simple two-page data form that gets filled out if you want to collect data when you go out and check for the, for the rains. Yeah? Yeah, so um, my daughter works on a farm with a lot of shallow water pools and sloping streams. Mm -hmm. December was really warm. In January, she walked out there one day in January. Yeah. Wow. In December, it been really warm. Right. December. Right. Has there been instances that, that ever happened where they just got totally confused? I, I'm i sure it happens. I hadn't heard about that happening. This is in the Hudson Valley? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the black deer. Oh, okay. Yeah, right, right. No, I haven't I hadn't had any of the reports of that. But um, I'm sure I'm sure it happens, you know. Um, because, but a lot of times, too, and I think the emergence of the vernal pool amphibians, too, it's also like daylight hours, you know, and, and a lot of nature is cued by how much daylight there is during the day. And um, so I don't know if they were, I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a snowdrop, not that this is a frog, but a snowdrop about to bloom in my garden like a week ago. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, it's, that was, it was still January actually when it happened. So it's been a really freaky weird winter. Yeah. Wow. And peepers will definitely breed, call even outside the breeding season. Because, you know, usually you think they're only calling for, for, to yeah. attract a mate. So why waste the energy of calling other times of the year? And, and I don't know if we know why they do it, but they definitely will sing other times. Like, you know, a lot of times I hear them in late summer um, into the fall. And Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how everything gets affected by this weird, weird uh, 
we totally have. I'm just hoping for snow still. <laughs> I have to get my cross country skiing fix in for this oh, year. Okay. Yeah, it's brutal, isn't it? <laughs> I yeah. was going to go up to the Adirondacks, but it's supposed to be like 20 to 40 below up there this week. This weekend. Can't, can't even get your skiing up there. Yeah, my friends went up to ski there last winter, and they ended up having to go hiking with, you know, yeah. uh, uh, like yak tracks because there was no snow to cross country ski. So, yeah, it would be really interesting to see how it affects a lot of aquatic habitats as well as, you know, just water resources in general. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, I'll be around closing up, you know, if you have any other questions. But I really appreciate you coming out and listening. Thank you. Yeah,